Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to talk to best-selling author Catherine Coulter, who keeps moving around her house, so I'm constantly dazzled by the places that she goes. She's invited me to come at Christmas sometime because she says that she goes all out. Is that true, that you're a mad Christmas decorator? Oh, yes. It, it's kind of sad, really. <laughs> No, not sad at all. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Anyway, we are here to talk today about a new FBI thriller with Dylan um, Savage and um, why do I keep going blank? Sherlock, um, called Reckoning, which is already a bestseller because in fact, it came out the first week in August and Catherine very ha kindly has signed copies for us and we still have some left. You know, interestingly enough, Catherine, um, Saturday is Bookstore Romance Day which may not have come across your radar, but I thought if we had any books left, we were gonna add it to our bookstore romance mix because there is a lot of romance in your thrillers, isn't there? Well, there is There is more, usually not, I guess a, a, a veritable skosh, but in this one, there is more. And uh, romance readers read everything. True. You know, they read mysteries, they, re they read everything. So I think that would be a great idea. Well, it's our, it's certainly our plan. No signed book ever goes wasted at the Poison Pen, <laughs> is our motto. <laughs> it's so much trouble. But um, you've got an ingenious story here. We have two different plots going on with different characters. But one of the things that I especially enjoyed, Catherine, about the book um, are the locations. I mean, you really glow. I mean, you don't always go for glamour, but I used to hang out at the Greenbrier when I lived in Virginia, and I was so pleased to see that you used it as the setting for some of the scenes in the book. Well, actually, that's interesting because the Greenbrier ER is in West Virginia, and I didn't want to do that because it was too far away for Washington, and I always have to be aware of, of time and distance. Uh, and so I spelled it A-R and kind of used the description of it a little bit. And the evidently the editor thought, and, and then I forgot about it, the editor thought that I had misspelled it and so changed it to an E again. So uh, I, I've already heard from a couple of people <laughs> telling me this is not Virginia. But <laughs> no, that is funny. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's in West Virginia. And in fact, when I worked at the Library of Congress back in the 70s, there was still a train that went directly from Union Station in Washington, D.C. to the Greenbrier Station because You're it was- kidding such... me. No, how no, long you know, the, the... was it? Um, it was a day trip. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't huge. In fact, you could, you could go to the Greenbrier from New York if you took the train, you know, to Union Station and change. But the Greenbrier was a major location during World War II. You know, it had all kinds of stuff going on there because it's this huge, gorgeous, white sprawling resort famous for its golf. The Duke of Windsor used to hang out there. And my father, who was a great golfer and used to do corporate retreats at the Greenbrier, once knocked him over in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were showering together? Well, <laughs> it, you know, it's a men's locker room deal. Oh. <laughs> and my father was a 300 pound, six foot something all-American tackle. And the Duke of Windsor was, you know, this little bitty guy and I think daddy said, you know, he just like moved his arm to reach for the soap or whatever and splat. Um, <laughs> That's and, a great story. Well, it's true. And I organized a meeting there for the Chamber of Commerce in the Virginia community where I lived then. And, um, and because I was the organizer, we got extra perks, you know, resorts do that. So I was assigned the Duke and Duchess of Windsor's bedroom, which had very tasteful twin beds, four poster twin beds and lots of material. Because remember, Dorothy Draper, the really famous 1940s and so forth um, interior decorator, mm -hmm. splashed you know, color and cabbage roses and all kinds of wonderful stuff around the hotel. And I just read, Catherine, that they have done a huge revamp of the hotel and they've restored a lot of the gloriosity of Dorothy Draper. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, then you, you can see them from my descriptions in the book. There's a little bit of that, but I changed it enough because if I had used the real Greenbrier, and I, I tend never to do this, right. you get so many people telling you, well, you got that wrong. Yeah. You know, this street isn't there, it's here. And so that's why I just make things up or try to in this case. 
But well, I, I think you're wise. And also, you know, you don't really want to murder people in places you might want to go stay. <laughs> it's just, very good point. No, very good point. Excellent point. But you're also in the Bellagio um, in Vegas. Um, you have a, a really stunning scene in which somebody has to escape from a balcony outside. Oh, that was of, at the Greenbrier. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Three stories into the swimming pool. Wasn't it convenient? There was a swimming pool in the drop zone. Oh, honey, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Right. Um, and then Australia. And um, and that's a really fascinating thing, too. So do you have a um, pitch you'd like to do for the book? Or I have two reviews that I can read, whichever way you want to go. Well, let's do a little of both. OK. Uh, all I can say about it is, is I really like the characters. And uh, I hope, you know, what, one thing that was a challenge, again, was the distance, because we go to Las Vegas, then we have to go to Maine, and then we have Florida and all that kind of stuff. Um, you, it, that, that takes such care. You have to exercise such care and try to figure out so many different things that I tend not to do it. But I did it in this book, and I think it worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I can say is I hope everybody enjoys it. I've gotten great feedback so far. And, uh, but the reviews are just wonderful. I love the, hearing them. <laughs> okay, well, let me read you one. Cause I okay, think yeah, 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 yeah. I can do this. I have two actually here, but this one I think is from Kirkus. Pulse pounding terror mixed with romance. Early in cultures, propulsive 26th FBI thriller. Virginia Commonwealth Prosecutor Kira Mandarian, who actually has a different name, but this is a name we'll go into, she's now working under, Relo was, was relocated to Australia after her parents were murdered by her uncle Leo. She returns home to Port Franklin, Virginia, and seeking to find out who killed her parents, Kira uncovers evidence of criminal activity among Port Franklin's elite and passes it on to FBI agent Dylan Savage. Meanwhile, Savage's wife and fellow FBI agent, Lacey Sherlock, takes time off from the FBI to help her friends, Molly and Ramsey Hunt. Sherlock agrees to watch over the Hunt's 12-year-old daughter, Emma, a piano prodigy, as she performs at the Kennedy Center in Washington. At an earlier concert, Emma, the granddaughter of a mob boss, narrowly escaped being abducted while performing in her home city of San Francisco. When Sherlock and Molly find themselves in danger, Sherlock must employ, I love this, her keenly honed survival skills. Well done, Catherine. <laughs> to, out, to out with their assistance now, assailants rather. Here's the line you're really gonna love. Scintillating suspense surrounds the dual mysteries as the stakes rise for Savage and Sherlock and those they're seeking to protect. Series fans will be riveted from the very first page. I could, oh, that's great beautiful. review. Oh, I had goosebumps. <laughs> Well, I sort of do too. And, and the other thing that's really great about it is that Kirkus Reviews is sort of famous for being, or infamous, I should say, for being snide. Um, so if you get a really great review for Kirkus, you know, from Kirkus, well done. Well, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but you're totally right. They're, they're, they're infamous and famous for giving left-handed compliments. This is really a great book, given that it's a romance, something like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. They didn't have any left-handed compliments in there. That was good. No, not at all. Actually, I don't think there's so much genre snobs as that they just, you know, they just have this kind of wicked, um, I don't know, maybe it's a click thing. You know how the media is where, you know, everything is about clickbait anymore. So I wonder if being like that is one way to engage more attention. I don't know. That's a good point. The trouble Publishers Weekly, I think this is it, or Library Journal, but I'm pretty sure it's Publishers Weekly. They had um, a very fine review too. After the murder of her parents in Virginia, 12-year-old Allison Rendell, who becomes Kira, barely escapes by climbing out a window. There's a lot of climbing out or dropping out of windows and balconies. You're, not, you're right about that. Lisa was <laughs> separated by a decade and a half. <laughs> right, and hiding in a cave. Her uncle Leo takes her back to his home in Australia and raises her to be a strong woman who helped him lead extreme adventures, adventures. But naturally, she still has mental scars and some PTSD. Now under the name Kira Mandarian, and after attending law school at the University of Virginia, she's returned to her hometown as the Virginia Commonwealth prosecuting attorney, 
hoping to solve the murder of her parents. And she takes up a wonderful name, E.N. Elliot Ness. I love that. You stole that <laughs> right out of real life, didn't you? Elliot Ness, the guy that took down, was it Al Capone, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what a great, what a great pseudonym for Kira. I mean, you'd think anybody hearing the name would suspect what she was up to. <laughs> yeah, I, that just came. I just thought, well, hmm, well, how is she going to sign this? Right. So, you know, do you like because um, um, Savage and Sherlock are married, do you like to give them separate case tracks? Um, I mean, they are both FBI agents, but that doesn't mean they'd automatically be assigned to work the same case. It goes back and I, I, I really depends on the plot. Right. I never can predict it. Uh, in the book I'm doing right now, there's a whole bunch of crossover, you know, and they are on one case together and then not so much on another one. So it really depends on the plots, you know, because I never really think about it, to be honest. It just well, I, I, I agree with you that it makes perfectly good sense to do it that way. I'm assuming that the FBI doesn't have, or at least not your FBI, does not have some rule about, you know, fraternization or marriage among um, among staff. I mean, I'm not, I don't know whether law enforcement really does that. Uh, the last I heard, the last I asked, yeah, there are married agents. There are married agents. To each other? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they don't have to be. I mean, I, I don't know yes, whether the other. CIA, I wonder, you know, I don't know if the CIA being a spy agency rather than law enforcement, I wonder if they have the same rules. I don't know. I have I mean, no idea. That's a good question. Well, you know, there. I do know some ex-CIA people, so I'll try to find out. But it did yeah, do. that it would be an interesting thing if you had CIA agents, um, you know, rival spy missions. But, but they can't really cooperate in the same way. I mean, in the FBI thing, they can share information, right? There's absolutely no reason why they can't help each other out or tell each other what's going on. Right, right. Well, I'm sure the same is true in the CIA, you know. Hmm. I don't know. I think it would be different, you know, because you'd be putting other people's lives at risk in different ways if you were, if you were doing that. Whereas in the FBI, theoretically, everybody's... Theoretically, yeah. Yeah, the same goal. But after all, as I said, you made up what what interested you in having them be FBI agents? Because you could have made them cops or you could have made them lawyers. Why the FBI? Do you want the honest to God's truth? Yeah. Okay, back with the co, you know, way back in the dark ages, the Andalusian period. Uh, when I first wrote the cove, it just came out of my fingers. Oh, well, he'll be an FBI agent. I knew nothing about the FBI. Nothing, but I made him an FBI agent, not a problem. And so then I was kind of stuck, particularly since Savage appears in the last third of the Cove, and then he becomes the, the mainstay in the series along with Sherlock. And so it just started out, it was total serendipity, total serendipity. It could have been CIA, it could have been anything. Well, you know, I can certainly understand that. Do you have CIA agents? Um, I mean, sorry, I got into the wrong wrong organization again. Do you have FBI agents that either provide you with information or critique you? Does it ever come up? Uh, I have wonderful people at the FBI uh, that I've met over the years. And my very, very best person had the absolute gall to retire last year. No. But <laughs> I know, I know. But for example, uh, I think it was Enigma about four, five or six books ago, and I had an infant kidnapped out of the nursery in the hospital, and I had no idea how this would work. So I call her up and I, and I say, help. And 30 minutes later, I was speaking to the supervisor of the CARD team. I can't remember what CARD stands for, but there's a specialized FBI unit that deals only with kidnapped infants from nurseries and hospitals. And so I, I, he laid it all out for me, everything that would be done and what the hospital would probably do if they were a really good hospital, which it was. And uh, so anytime I have a, a question, I, you know, that, and I just call, and I remember on one, I had to have a, a, a letter, like, dropped off. When you walk into the Hoover, if you want to visit, 
Uh, you know, you have to check in all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I wanted to drop off an envelope there and it was addressed to Savage. And so I called them up and I said, can I do this? And they said, oh, no, you can't. So what we did with there were about three or four agents and there were uh, a security people at the Hoover and we figured out, they did, how I could get what I wanted and get it right. So they're, they're very, very helpful. And I don't know if you know this or if the readers know this, but there is a unit in the FBI that it's their responsibility to know everything that's written by the FBI, uh, that, that's written about the FBI in the known universe. And way back, it was six months before 9-11. Uh, they had read my books. I was very pro-FBI. And they called me up and flew back to Washington. And it was kind of a VIP thing. It was wonderful. So I met a whole lot of people, including the head of the behavioral unit. And he was always a great help to me. I, I, I'd never been able to understand how those people could do what they do. Three years is usually the maximum you can deal with it. But anyway, uh, so I made a lot of uh, contacts then and a lot of friends. And it was a good thing it was six months before because after 9-11, a cop coach couldn't have gotten under the door oh, uh, at Quantico or at the Hoover or anywhere, yeah. So no, it was, yeah, it was such a remarkable change. I was the first uh, National Book Festival um, and I was asked to help organize it because I was a librarian at the Library of Congress. And one day they wrote to me and said, Mrs. Bush wants to do a National Book Festival like the Texas Book Festival. And since I'd gone over to the dark side, i.e. out of the library and to retail book selling, um, I could help them. So I recruited um, a number of authors and none of us had any idea what it was really going to be like or what it was about. But in any place, we convened in Washington on the weekend inside the, the Library of Congress. And when it was over, I took them all, the ones I'd invited to the Folger to see the Shakespeare play. And we walked back across Washington and it was one of those magical, beautiful Southern nights. Everything was in bloom. It was peaceful. It was stunning. It was gorgeous. And the next morning we flew away and the next morning was in fact 9-11. Oh, good heavens. And it, you know, it, it, I mean, we all realized that the city that we had walked across that night would never be the same again. No, that's amazing. Uh, I was there in 2003 at the book festival. Right. Yeah, yeah. That I was think I remember, I mean, because I did go to some of the early ones. My fellow intern, John Cole, John Y. Cole, whom I'm sure you met in the course of that, was the guy that really organized those early ones. He's retired now. And um, and happily is spending time in Phoenix, so we kind of get to reminisce. Um, oh, that, that's it. an amazing story. That's just I amazing. I it wish came. it weren't a true story. Um, the other part of it, which I, I should mention just because I'm still so grateful to them, is that I had flown to um, the town in Virginia where I had lived for a while to visit friends and arrived just as, you know, it was all going down in New York and um, all the planes were grounded. And I called the Avis people because I had just picked up a rental car at the airport. And I said to them, you know, um, I'm not quite sure what to do. And I'll never forget this. They were crying and they said to me, just keep the car. They said, drive it home, you know, because there's no way you're going to get there otherwise. So I did. I drove my Avis rental car all the way across on US 40 from Virginia to, um, to Phoenix. And um, I've never forgotten that because it was such a kind thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, well, it's something that no American will ever forget. Well, probably anybody in the world will ever forget, you know. So well, it's, it's like 1941. You know, if you were alive then, you'd remember Pearl Harbor. I was only 11 months old, so I don't, I don't remember Pearl Harbor. But you're right, major events like that. I'm sure that there is nobody who was alive when Dunkirk happened in the UK, who would ever forget, you know, Dunkirk, some of those, yeah, some yeah. of those moments. But going back to your organization and the FBI, I think that the child thing probably um, was inspired by the Lindbergh kidnapping, which, you know, was traumatic. And it, I can't remember whether kidnapping was a federal crime if you cross state borders before or after the Lindbergh case. 
but there was I don't I cannot tell you I obviously it is now and it has been forever right. uh, and, and I they think, didn't have special people who are experts right. in wave mapping I think it was the Lindbergh case and you'll you'll love this story Sue Grafton who was just a dear friend and um and would tell wonderful stories about herself I mean she came to the store right up until her penultimate book when she was too ill with cancer to come for the last one that she wrote. But anyway, one of her stories, which I've always loved is she started out writing K and her choice for K was K is for kidnapping. And she was like 180 pages in with PI, California private eye, Kinsey Milhone and the kidnapping case when it dawned on her. Kinsey couldn't be working a kidnapping case. It was <laughs> a federal crime. And she had to throw the entire book away and start over again. And it became Chaos for Killer, which I've always thought was her most mundane <laughs> title. <laughs> that's, the, that's good. That's good. Yeah, good yeah, she, had a, she had a great sense of humor. She could tell stories like that about herself. But, you know, it, it is true that you do have to pay attention if you're writing um, a police or a PI or an FBI or whatever it is, you do have to pay attention to what it is those organizations can and cannot do. Exactly, exactly. And I'm sure I've made some blunders over the years, you know, and uh, thankfully most readers don't know or are they're too nice to say anything. <laughs> well, it's fiction. I find it all so interesting because you and I have talked in the past about, you know, romance because you wrote a number of romances before you really dove into the thriller world. In fact, um, I remember reading your your first one that you recommended to me. Did you do you find that having uh, written romance prepared you very well for writing these vivid characters and emotional scenes? No, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I I don't think there's any real correlation. Uh, you, you know, and one thing that you, you know again, most women are the are the retail book buyers. And women will read anything. Um, I think a lot of women go to romance first because it's it's written to them and it's just fantastic escapism. Um, but it, a lot of what they also liked, I know in my books, my my historicals tend to all have mysteries in them. So mm -hmm. my brain worked that way. And in terms of characterizations, I think that's simply the writer. I don't think that's the genre. Um, okay, well, that certainly that certainly makes sense. I guess what I was really thinking is that romance is powered more by characterization than plot because there is basically really only one basic or two basic plots for romance. You know, boy meets girl, boy win, you know loses girl, boy wins girl, or vice versa. And now it can be, you know, girl and boy, or, you know, now we have queer romances where it's boy meets boy or girl meets boy or girl or, or whatever, whatever. binary meets, never mind. Let's whatever. <laughs> but, but basically, the basic plot is that people are attracted, complications ensue, and yeah. the suspense of the book is whether they will overcome them and, yeah. and get together or not. Um, and so that it really is character that powers them. Um, and that's really, I guess, the relationship, I sure. But I, I think I think one reason that they were successful was well, let me back up. I noticed a long, long time ago, it was very common, particularly in contemporary romances, where you would have the internal dialogue. Somebody would say something, and then this would spark a feeling that could go on for three pages. At which point you don't even remember what the question was, what anybody said, and you don't care. And I have noticed, and, and so if you have a lot of different elements, like you have mystery, you have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, a couple of really cool characters, you have humor, it tends to avoid that sort of thing. And I've noticed now, I'm told, I really don't read the contemporary romance anymore simply because I don't have time. But I understand that they're getting, that's really gone away now, that it's more dialogue driven, which it should be. Um, and that again, adds to characterization. The internal dialogue was, all, I don't know who started that or why it was found so attractive. Mm -hmm. I mean, all it did was stop the plot in its tracks, you know, but maybe you're right. In some of those, it was just boy meets girl, blah, blah. So let's stop the plot. Who cares? There's no plot. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
I, but I just you know, to do it. Increasingly in the modern romance genre, they're called rom-coms, which means basically romantic comedy. Um, and a lot of them are focused, it must have been the movie, the name of which I can't remember, um, you know, about the bookseller and the romance and so forth. But um, a huge number of them are, are bookish. They're, you know, they feature um, people involved in the book world, readers, or, you know, the reading list is a new one. I was just running, running by some to put into our August newsletter, the remains of the August newsletter. Um, and I, I, I don't remember that comedy was that big a deal way back, you know, when I was early reading romance, but now the rom-com seems to be the dominant form. If it's not the Regency, which is kind of an excuse for softer, actually even harder porn these days. Um, you know, the Regency yeah, people have never even thought. touched, yeah. but yeah. But yeah. now there's, you know, this incredible, and then Bridgerton has had an amazing effect. And now we're getting, Reg you know, um, Regency romances that have um, um, multiple, um, you know, cultures and races involved, which I think is a great thing, but completely unlikely to have been true. Mm -hmm. Very. That's also very true. <laughs> yeah. Very, very true. Yeah. But it's, it's difficult to see, uh, since, you know, like since my education is in that period in right. England and in Europe, it's very difficult for me to watch something like Bridgerton because it's so jarring. It's so anti history and yet they're wearing the right clothes well why are you wearing the right clothes if you don't have the right kind of people in those clothes to be true to the time but if you want to rewrite history i guess that's a fine it's just that i personally have problems with it since i know the period so well you know and who did what to whom well ah. yeah i think it it really becomes like fantasy for me anyway and i i will say that the clothes are so astonishing and the backgrounds, which are Georgian, but there's, I understand it, they're actually filmed in Ireland because there's not that much Georgian architecture other than in the city of Bath that's really intact or available for, um, for movie making. But, you know, I think, I think the clothes and the, and the architecture and so forth give you the period, but like you, you know, I keep thinking this is just, it just can't happen. You know, yeah. so I'm 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 watching it essentially as as fantasy, um, and you know, there's some there's some really um, erotic scenes in it that also you know, if you were really sticking with the, re I mean, I'm sure they had sex just like that. It's just that that's not part of that's not part of what people who wrote Regency really you know really wrote about. But did you ever read Loretta Chase? Loretta no, Chase. Did, uh, her name is Loretta Chase, and she wrote a book called Mr. Perfect and Miss Impossible and Mr. Wonderful. It's kind of a trio. And she managed to get the Regency stuff right. She managed to get in history because one of them is about um, building canals, you know, the, to move, move stuff, goods, especially from the potteries. She manages to get all of that right, but they're funny. Um, you know, they, they have a wonderful sense of humor in I thought they were kind of perfect upgrades for, or not upgrades, but updating is the word I want, mm -hmm. um, for the romance, um, the Regency romance. And now I, I don't think the Regency romance means anything other than people are, are attempting to set it in, you know, and not even getting the Regency right, because the, re the Regency is actually a fairly short period. Yes. You know, but there we go. Anyway, back to back to the FBI. Um, do you know, by the way, that J.T. Ellison, who wrote several books with you, started a series under a pseudonym, and the heroine is Jane Thorne, C.I.A. Yes, Red yes, Red Master of the Shadows. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've told her that she, that she and I are each other's rogues. <laughs> Meaning? Oh, that you haven't read the new one. Well, a rogue is. Uh, they don't have magic in themselves, but their magic is ignited by their master. Got right? it. And so uh, Jane Thorne is the master of this particular rogue who is also her lover. So it's very, very interesting. So there's- I love, the, I love the first one. And um, the second one has just come in. She signed a bunch for us, but I have it over there winking at me and it's going to be- <laughs> 
Well, if you if I look across my office, there are all these books winking at me, but I have to be disciplined. I have to read them in the order that I need to, because you know, if I fall into November, all of a sudden I'm not going to do justice to August. So it's really hard. Sometimes I sit there and I look at a book that I really, really want to read, but it's like three months down the road. And I think, all right, that's going to be my reward when I, you know, when I get from where I am. I don't see how you can resist. I, I mean, if I, there was a book I really, really wanted to read, I'd read it. I don't care. <laughs> well, it's unfortunately the discipline of retail, you know, because yeah, yeah, you're right. You're my staff are trying, to, trying to deal with August. I did a, um, an Instagram post yesterday and the author did a tweet and we are suddenly inundated. I think we have 857 books that just fell down, you know, this morning. Um, and so if you're dealing with that kind of thing, you really do have to stay on track. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I don't. <laughs> but you're an author, you know, you can have all that fun. Of, but you, you have the same problem. I mean, you know, at some point, it comes down to discipline for you to make your deadline. You can't, you know, I mean, unless your publisher has been in an unusually forgiving mood, they really do want your book by the time that they expect it. I'm the most reliable author in the history of reliability. Are you? Yes. Uh, even way back in the 80s, they would schedule my book before I'd even started writing it. Oh, my God. They knew I would get it in in plenty of time. I've never been late, ever. And one year when I was, I gave them so much warning because I realized, uh, I think uh, one editor told me up to 60% of authors under contract are late. Wow. Can you imagine what they're doing? They're running around trying to fill in the slots and doing this and doing that. And I, I mean, and their, their lives are so harried. And uh, so whenever I speak to people about writing and, and publishing, I said the most important thing you can do for your publishing house is to be on time. You know, you're the one setting the date, not keep it. Uh, because they, they really, it's so hard on them. And I wouldn't be too happy with you as an editor if you did that to me, you know, without tons of warning. So yeah, that's, that's just super important. Which means then you have to be disciplined, which I is, thankfully. How did you get to be so disciplined? That's impressive. Do you, you, do you know that I never really gave it any thought? It's simply that in the morning, you know, I do all the work on the computer and then you obviously just go and you work until such and such a time. I mean, it's just, it's habit, but it's discipline. You just, this is your job, in other words. You know, when you have to be at the store, you have to be at the store. When Jacob has to do something, he has to be there to do it, right? Yeah. So this requires scheduling and preparation. It just requires discipline. And, uh, you know, everybody has a talent. And to, to really give yourself a chance to succeed or fail at anything, you have to be disciplined. You know that. Well, it's certainly true in retail. As you know, there was all this bit about people working from home and all the rest of it. If you work in a retail business as a bookseller, for example, that's not a choice you get to make. You no, can't no. sell books to people from your home. So, you know, I think, I, I thought that the pandemic really highlighted a lot of differences in, you know, job choices and how jobs are executed. But let me ask you another question, which I always find really fascinating and would be harder to answer at the outset, I think. How do you know when you can let a book go? Because to be a published author, you actually do have to let the book go. I'm sorry if I'm going to disappoint you, but it's it's never even been a question. The book goes and then it's finished and then it goes into the publishing house and and then I'm already mm -hmm. starting to think about the next one. So it's never it's never a consideration, I guess. Well, I ask because we've had so many conversations with authors about revisions. And, you know, there are authors who are apparently revising and revising and revising. And at some point, you know, in that process, you have to stop reaching for perfection. 
Oh, oh I see what you mean. I, 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 I misunderstood your question. Okay. Uh, well, the, my husband is really my editor. And when he deems that the book is perfect, then it goes. Okay. Well, as perfect as it, as it can be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, that's another question that's come up recently, which I find interesting, is if um, what, what happens if actual events take over, you know, over overcome your story. And, and I was talking to, I'm trying to think who it was the other day. And um, he had thought that he was being original in having, you know, Russians arrive and, and do something or other. But by the time the book published, Russians had in fact, you know, shown up and done something. And, um, and that I think, especially if you're writing any kind of international thriller or something, mm -hmm. that could be a real problem. It could be. I agree. I agree totally. And that that's part of the question about do you put COVID in your books or not? No. You know, but I, I'm just saying it's a, it's a question that has come up with so many conversations with authors is do they, do they put it in the past? Do they put it in the future? Do they just skip it all together? You know, how do you handle it? Because whatever you do, you're going to date your book to some degree. Uh, indeed you are, but I, I think there's just, there's so many complications on COVID, so many, and not least of which is the politicizing of it, which, and, and then that would just be a nightmare, a nightmare, because you'd have to come down on one side or the other. I mean, I, I would never want to deal with it. And my favorite soap opera, the, the old and the listless, the young and the restless, uh, it, it just didn't exist. Uh, COVID never existed, which I appreciate. I'm glad. I'm glad because you don't need it. You just don't need it because we well, all lived with it. I, I don't disagree. I mean, you know, if people read books in part to escape, you know, or to relax and so forth, the last thing they want to read about is being is, con confronted with daily life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely true. So do you, um, what are you, what are you working on now? You've already talked about the fact that you segue right into a new book when you finish an old one. Are you doing another FBI book or are you going to do something more of a standalone? Uh, well, I don't do standalones, really. Okay. Um, it's an FBI and I always try to take two weeks off, but after a week I start getting antsy. So it's pretty sad actually, but we <laughs> did spend a week up at Lake Tahoe. So that was wonderful. No work, just, you know, having a good time, but yes, it's the 27th FBI and uh, bringing back by popular demand a character who first appeared in Nemesis. This is the book where Sherlock kicks big butt, big terrorist butt. And there was a character in it, and we're in England, and her name was Lady Elizabeth Palmer. And I really liked her, but because I, I couldn't get to know her that much because things had to happen to, to come down to the end of it. And so she's now starring in her own show and she's having problems that date from that other book. And um, so, so she's very, she's very cool. Three well, as long as you're having life. fun with it, you know, I think it's so important that you're enjoying it because if you're having fun writing it, then it will be oh, yeah. much more enjoyable for the reader. I did like, and I, I can't say why or to give anything away, but I thought, I thought this book wound up in at least two different levels in a really wonderful place. So, you you know, they were kind of, they're happy places. Um, I, happy I like places. that. I really like the fact that, um, that you, that's how you brought the whole thing to a conclusion. Well, I have been, been I will not tell you either, but the, the very last one, the last two words in the entire book, and uh, uh, one person gave it away on Facebook and I wanted to shoot them. No, 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 I'm being very quiet about it. But for the past five or six years, I would, and this this from women, of course, saying, well, when could this happen? When we want, we want it to happen, we want it to happen. So finally I said, why not? Why not? But I like- Given I, that the books take, you know, take place usually two weeks after the other one should, should be, doing this over a period of probably a hundred books. <laughs> so, right. I don't know how this is going to work out. 
Well, it didn't work out one way or the other. I also didn't mention that I really like Special Agent Griffin Hammersmith. Um, yeah. And I, I like the fact that he has a he has a really nice story in this book, but he's a neat guy. Um, and it must be fun for you to write. You know, I mean, obviously, Savage and Sherlock are the leads, but, you know, you must enjoy really crafting these other characters as well. Oh, yeah. Well, Griffin's been in probably six or seven books. Right. Um, and 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 the, what's so fun is that he's gorgeous, you know, and like women just stop in the hall in the Hoover building staring after him. But uh, he finally, he finally, things worked out for him finally, because he's been having problems. He'd been having problems. Well, it's nice to throw a bone, you know. <laughs> <As an author. laughs> and what a bone. <laughs> yeah. You can do that, you know, which is which is great. You're master of this universe. So if you decided to go like X or Y, you know, you can you can certainly do that. Um, I've been sort of rambling all over the place because the problem with this book is that there's so little we can say about it without spoilers. Um, is there anything you'd like to talk about that I have failed to ask you? Hmm. Well, it's interesting because there there wasn't really a mystery. You know, it was building up to finally nail somebody. Um, and some of the books are like that. And then some, I myself as the writer, wouldn't know who the killer was until 50 pages to the end, which meant there's no way a reader could guess it because I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are some books like this one where you know, but it's how to get them and how to, to finally latch on to them. Uh, and that's always a, a really neat mental exercise, too, you know, and, 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 and Pepper Jersey, she's the federal attorney who uh, comes on the, uh, the Elliot Ness story, and, uh, and she kind of ends up dating uh, Jeter Thor, who was the one who saved Kira when she was 12. He was a rookie at the time. And, you know, when the book starts, uh, he's now uh, heading up the detectives and so forth. So it, it, it was a lot of fun to see the changes in people. And, and there were some interesting people uh, like Uncle Leo. I adored him. He's wonderful. I agree. But he didn't really, you didn't see him. Well, you saw him at the beginning and at the end, which was just fine. Thank you. But he's a live presence throughout the book which was good and he he had to be he's so neat he is just so neat I really really like him no, I to see. <laughs> oh Maybe. and all the adventures she went on I have a friend that I uh email every day in Queensland and uh she did tell me that I I did not use one I, I used one word Australian Aussie slang that is no longer used, but the book promised me that it was contemporary. So I'd like to shoot them. But uh, she, she, I, had, I had asked her a lot of questions on that. And she said, all the places I mentioned, she said it brought back such wonderful memories because she'd been to all of them, you know, and remembered, and remembered feeling like that, like Kira felt when she was describing that, like Fraser Island or, or whatever, or the, or the mm -hmm. King's Territory. Uh, so that that that's very nice to have constant feedback from somebody who lives there, you know. How did you make a friend in Queensland? Mm, she emailed me uh, maybe five years ago uh, about a book, and I don't remember the book or anything else. But we just hit it off right away. And uh, she is she was a flight attendant, and her son. Uh, her eldest son was a pilot, and of course the airlines because they're so smart and they think ahead like baby food. Okay, now what's going to happen if we do A? Do you think B would ever? Oh no, it's not even considered. And anyway, let me not go on there. They fired everybody just like the Americans did. Fired everybody. So her son ended up in Germany, and he speaks fluent German to fly German planes. But then I kept pushing her. I says, look, the American, uh, they're desperate for pilots, desperate, 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 blah, blah, blah. They're paying like 50% more, blah, blah, blah. So he ends up in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, I didn't know this and she didn't know it either, but 
if you're an Australian pilot, you have to have special dispensation to be able to fly American planes, which means you have to go back to Australia, meet with the American embassy, who has at least a three month waiting period to get this worked out to get back to the US. Now, what's going on here? You know, this is ridiculous. We need pilots, they need pilots, and you have all of this crap going on. And nobody, nobody thinks, could we maybe do this in a better way? Nobody thinks that. It's the most amazing thing. Could we maybe rule the world for a day? What a good idea. I'm trying to envision whether Australian pilots fly on the wrong side of the plane. <laughs> Because I've driven in Australia and New Zealand, you know. Well, but, given that the planes are built here, probably not. I know. You know, you wouldn't <laughs> think you wouldn't think that that would actually be a role. I mean, I remember one of the scariest drives of my whole life was when my daughter and I. But I made the mistake. You'll love this, but it, well, I didn't make a mistake. I was naive. I told both of my girls that when they graduated from high school, I would take them on a trip to anywhere they wanted to go. So my oldest daughter wanted to go to the Caribbean and we ended up, we did a week on a wonderful ship and um, I had taken time off from work. And when it was the last day, she burst into tears and asked if we had to go home because the ship had a different itinerary for the second week that she wanted to do. So I, um, I thought, okay, it's not unreasonable, but I'm telling you, this was before you could use credit cards and things on cruise ships. This was a really long time ago. I had to borrow money from the maitre d' in the dining room and the captain in order, in order to fund the second week. <laughs> my hands on money. But anyway, my younger daughter, because um, I thought, okay, Caribbean, that'll be great. So when my younger daughter graduated, I said, what do you want to do? I want to go to the beach, she said. And I thought, well, okay, back to the Caribbean or whatever. It turned out that the beach she envisioned was the coral reef and, you know, north of Brisbane, that Australia was going to be her beach. So I found myself suddenly going to Australia with almost no preparation. But I, I loved it. And, and, and where, place, where did you stay? Well, you know, I'm trying to remember, Susan, when was this? It was You went to the Great Barrier Reef. In the, yeah, we did. It was in the very early... 19, it was the late 70s or early 80s whenever we made this trip. And Australia, to a great degree then, traveling was just like touring the U.S. in the 50s. I mean, it was a lot of old motels and, you know, um, we were with a group because I didn't know enough about Australia to figure, you know, that I could do this whole thing on my own. And um, it, it was like a trip back Going to New Zealand is like dropping back 50 years if you were British. Agreed. But going to Australia at that point was really like dropping back 50 years if you were American. But while we were in Sydney, and my condition for doing this trip is that she had to go to the opera with me in Sydney, and she's not a big opera fan, so that's another whole story. But anyway, I rented a car so that we could go and tour the Blue Mountains during our several days in Sydney. And I forgot because it had been a while since I'd driven in England, I forgot that the Australians, you know, were going to be all left-hand drive and the Blue Mountains are, you know, and there I am, you know, first in Sydney traffic and then through the mountains in the car. And um, it was nerve wracking. I've always remembered that. I wish but we got to wine country and I could have just drunk, you know. It would've been, <laughs> would've been great. You did it and you didn't kill anybody. So no, no, didn't even wreck the car. Um, and, you know, I, I actually, don't mind left-handed driving, you just have to get used to it. My mm -hmm. husband does a lot of it and I know I can hear him sort of saying to himself, you know, stay left or whatever, because your impulse, you're fine unless there's a crisis. And then your muscle memory is almost always gonna pull you in the wrong direction. It mm -hmm. just, it just will, you know. It's true, it's true. But it's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous place in Queensland, I think is, you know, cause it's in the North and it's kind of, it's wetter. Um, there's some actual jungle, there are crocodiles, all of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think it's a gorgeous part of Australia. Wow. But anyway, the pilot thing, that's fascinating. I wonder why. Are same thing here, same thing in Australia, same thing in Europe. They, they, and, and what makes it so amazingly stupid here 
was that you and I as taxpayers to the government gave the airlines billions of dollars. So what did they use that money on? Because they fired everybody. What, you know, and and they should have kept everybody on. I mean, it, it, it makes no sense, but let's not go there because it's now over. But the airlines are still so mightily screwed up. You know, and the airports too, because the airports fired people too, which is why they can't process enough people. Exactly. I don't think, Catherine, to be really fair, I don't think anybody expected that dramatic a rebound. And if nothing else coming out of COVID proves that people are mostly really social animals. I mean, I'm not particularly, I'm much more so, you know, because I'm a reader, right? And a, and a writer and so forth. And so are you, but I'm, I'm not compulsively social in the way that apparently so many people are. They just, there was a whole article in the Wall Street Journal. I think it was the Journal, maybe it was the Times the other day um, about how people are not traveling with their family. They're so sick of their families. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that they, they are, you know, it's all like friends and other stuff. I don't think anybody really expected that tremendous a rebound of, you know, people who've been caged up, many of them in smaller places. I mean, you, you're not in a small place. I have a really big house. I just have a husband and three puppies, you know, I don't have children or, you know, grandparents and aunts and uncles and all the rest of it here. But for people who did, I can really understand, you know, why there would be this momentum to push away. Well, but did they think this was going to last forever? I don't know. I oh, don't that's know. ridiculous. That's absolutely, uh, no, no. It's like the baby food thing. Yeah, I know. It. They say, well, gee, what are we going to do for baby food if we close? What, you know, where is the brain? That's what bothers me is there, is no, there was no thought given to, wait a second, if we do A, what's what's B going to be? You know? I know. That's what legal training does for you. And that's what writing does for you. It's all about consequences. You know, if, if you're a lawyer, the thing that you are trained for is to anticipate unintended consequences. You know, if A, then B. And, you know, whether you're doing estate planning. But if or, you were in upper management, wouldn't that be in your job description? Well, you would think so. But, um, but I find it fascinating. You're absolutely right. I mean, my staff have a kind of childlike faith that I can solve any problem. And, you know, one solution, in fact, to, to solving a problem is to recognize you can't solve it. And then you have to do something else, you know. I mean, there's no fix available. So you have to do something else. And I think that's part of the problem, too is that oftentimes people don't want to acknowledge that. Possibly. I see Jean Al's book behind you. You do, yes. Land of the Painted Cave, yeah. It's my autographed copy. We did an event for her many years ago, yeah. and, um, and I kept one. I, I need to clean my office. My background behind me is not my beautiful library or even the better part of my office, but it's the place where I can close the door so that, <laughs> so that the doorbell and the puppies and all the rest of it don't go crashing in here. If I thought this was gonna keep up, see, this is me now hiding my head. I keep thinking surely this won't go on, that we won't be doing Zoom events forever and I won't have to do that revamping my office and then I'm proved wrong. <laughs> and yeah. even even if when events are everybody's doing events again you don't want to because of the airline travel well we're doing well, i mean i have sandra brown tonight at seven with ashley winstead we did a lovely event we have three huge ones coming right up um and then september labor day weekend we have three major authors in three straight days i mean we have we have a longmire with craig johnson we have a Cussler with Mike Madden, and we have Laurie King's new book, which is wonderful. And that's Saturday, Monday, and Tuesday. And I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah, no, we're, we're mostly doing, uh, well, not mostly, but I would say we're coming up on 70% live events. Scott Turow's coming, Nelson DeMille's coming, Michael Connolly's coming, Janet Ivanovich is coming. Um, you know, but that could all stop on a dime if if there's some weird variant or resurgence, it's hard, it's hard to be 100% confident that, that you know, it will all go that way. But the other thing that we are really- Barbara, thinking, I make you a promise. What's that? It will all be fine. Well, I hope so. I mean, it'll be all right because we can go back to Zoom if we have to. And in fact, Tuesday night, 
we had a terrible monsoon. I don't know if you've seen any of the photos of Phoenix flooding and, and, and floods are always the case here because the ground doesn't absorb any water. And it used to be that if that happened, an event was a catastrophe because nobody came. But now with Zoom, with streaming, because we stream the live events from the store, even if like five people showed up at the store, 500 people watched it. Yeah. And so it, you know, it's a it's a technology that can save you. But what we think we've done to ourselves is we've turned into kind of the Netflix of the book world. And as a result, we have fewer people attending than we like because it's a little disappointing for the audience. I mean, for the author, because there's not enough, there's not enough energy in the room. Mm -hmm. It's not the book sales are fine, you know, the, the views and everything are great. But I think some authors find it somewhat disheartening not to see, you know, as many people as they as they used to. It is not, disheartening. It is. Yeah, I know. And I don't I don't know if we can fix that. We've actually thought about not streaming over over Labor Day. You know, if we don't stream, maybe more people will come. They can't just stay home and mm -hmm. you know, watch it and and order the book. I really I don't even know what COVID did to our to our audience. I don't know how many people relocated, how many people, you know, developed medical problems, how many people lost too much money. I mean, there's no real way to know yeah. who the audience is right now because it's such a huge three years is an enormous gap. Yeah. Have you bounced back in terms of liquidity? Well, we never, that's never been an issue. I mean, we, we, we did super well all the way through the pandemic. It's, it's just the people. Mm. I just, we're just not finding enough people coming to the store. But interestingly enough, making my case is that we had two authors whose primary fans don't normally shop with us. And so they don't know we stream. And so they came and packed the store. So I do think that it really is that we have taught people they can just stay home and watch it <laughs> and order their books. Um, and, and you can keep in your pajamas. <laughs> well, you know, driving across town, driving through the weather, the price of gas, you know, a whole lot of different factors come into play. So we'll see. We might put a moratorium on streaming and see what happens. I just don't know. You know, we're feeling our way forward. It is yeah. different nothing went right back to the way it was yeah yeah so there we are so jacob let me call you up and see if are you there jacob behind the screen there you are right Hi, jacob. Hi. Hey. Any, any questions or comments or you'd like to comment about how things are going at the store since obviously <laughs> you have a different yeah, I, don't, I, don't than I, do. I don't want to think about that right now um yeah we do have a few uh questions on facebook if you don't mind Catherine. um this one uh this one's from David Robertson, and it, it kind of relates to your creative process. Um, and you can expand on that further if you want to about your drafting and, and um, your process on, of actually writing. Um, do you archive your ideas, uh, scenes, characters as you write? Um, uh, essentially, what he's asking is, do you have a kind of a filing system for ideas that you could either incorporate in the book that you're writing right now or um, put it into a book uh, later down the line? Uh, the answer is no, but I do know authors who do that, that they'll get an idea, they will put it in a file. Uh, I've just never, I've never gotten in the habit, and it, so it just never occurs to me to do that. So the answer is no. Okay. And uh, how many books have you written, Catherine? The one I just started is number, oh my, 89. 89? Does it get any easier? No. 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 <laughs> Every book is different. You never know what's going to like smack you in the head. But isn't that what makes there. it fun? I mean, if that challenge weren't there, would you actually enjoy doing it as much? Oh, when a book is easy to write, it's very enjoyable. Trust me. Uh, when when it's a bear to write, you're you're pulling your hair out, you know, and driving all over the road. <laughs> yeah. But you go back to it, so it obviously isn't enough to discourage you. No, because again, every book is different. Some are very difficult, some are not, some, but they're all fun. They're all fun. There was only one book that I, FBI book that I wrote that was very, 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 very difficult that I never liked, but people do. So I'm not going to even tell you the title. Okay, that's fair. 
Well, it looks like that's it for the questions on Facebook. Well, that sucks. <laughs> Jacob, what you want to do is you want to write up five questions of your own and pretend. Yeah. I've told him that. <laughs> now, now I've told you this. So would you do this? Yes, right. absolutely. So here's one of those questions, which is, and it comes up a lot, is, you know, what do you enjoy reading personally? And is there anything that you would recommend to the audience? Real, I, I, first, I was very, very sorry to hear about Stuart's death. Yeah. Um, uh, I've always enjoyed the Barrington books. I mean, they're, 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 <laughs> they're popcorn. They are just popcorn. It's wonderful. They're fantasy. <laughs> they are absolutely the most fun. And Stuart, Stuart incorporated in them all the things he personally loved. He had a golf stream. He loved to fly. So we oh, had to play. You're flying boats. half the book. Yes. That's right. You know, the guy, you know, Stone is collecting boats, planes, houses, and women. And yeah. that was Stuart. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, it's very fun. Um, Actually, I, I'm very, very fond of Nora writing as, as J.D. Robb. Yes. Very, very much. Uh, she and I started the series about the same time. I'm on book number 27. And excuse me, she's on book 57. She is amazing. She really she's is. An alien. Well, she's an alien. That's okay. She accepts this. Uh, just... Oh goodness, now, now you've just caught me. Uh, I like Michael Connolly. Um, I do not like the Harry Bosch series. I don't like him. Uh, do, you, do you watch that? Have you watched it? We have watched it. I really enjoyed the new Lincoln Lawyer. I think, you know, I thought the McConaughey movie was really good, but I think this guy and the cast are, are are very good and i i've forgotten how clever the plot is in it i was so annoyed i'm not going to reveal the end but i was so annoyed at the end because i had completely forgotten the you know the technique um that that made that book work and there it was all over again and i thought damn i've missed it twice <laughs> <laughs> but um do you, is it the books or is it the cast in Bosch that find, you don't find too appealing? I just don't care for his character. Period. Yeah, yeah I, 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 just, like, I can't remember his name, but I don't like him. But that's yeah. just that's just me. What's what is a little bit aggravating now in terms of TV is there's a new series out, and it will be stream, and you have to pay eleven dollars to see you know, to buy a subscription to see this one thing and you don't care about any, I mean, it's just gotten insane. It's gotten insane. So I really wanted to see uh, Mr. Manfield list, uh, but it's on some, it's, it's Canadian. So it's on a streaming service that you've never heard of in your life. No, no, that's Murdoch. Season 15 of Murdoch. But you can't see it unless you buy this subscription to whatever it is. Ah! Now, Jacob, you have your marching orders. You have prepared five questions, okay? <laughs> right. Well, okay. Um, we'll talk. Well, actually, about that. actually, we have a we have a few more questions from uh, Facebook that popped up. Oh, good. Um, See, you got so, them going, Catherine. This is from Valerie. Um, no standalones. Um, has it ever grabbed your interest to um, write outside of this series again? Uh, I have, well, I have done a, I have done some standalones, but this was this was a while back. Yeah. And what happened was is I started slowing down because I'm now an elder, and instead of doing one long historical romance a year and one his uh, one FBI thriller, um, I had to drop the long historical. So I started writing the little twenty thousand word novellas. The sixth one is coming out in the fall, so that's. That's kind of what I'm doing now. So that's also a series. But the standalones are older books. Valerie, I would recommend Beyond Eden. It's my own personal favorite of all the books I've written. And it's a standalone. And do you like do you like Dennis Lehane? Dennis Lehane. No, I've never had anything to do with him. Why? 
Valerie asks. I think she yeah. means his work rather than Dennis personally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if you don't want to go in a certain direction, then you're not going to see what's in that direction. You're just not, you know, if you don't pick the direction, you don't see the scenery. So no, the answer is no. I, I what do you recommend? I would, I think a drink before the war is a really brilliant, it's Dennis's first novel, um, which won the Seamus Award after I pointed out to the Seamus Committee that they had missed it and they made an exception um, for their normal submission process because I had put off reading it because the title made me think for some reason, I was sure it was a World War I story. I just, a drink before the war sounded, doesn't it? I mean, it really sounds like that. And I don't like World War I stories very much because it's such a tragic war. So I put off reading it and finally, I think it was like Christmas and there it was. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna clear off my shelf. And all I right, plunged, I'll give it a shot then. I'll yeah, give it a plunged shot. into the Boston underworld and all. And I thought, oh my God, you know, here we go. So, all right, thank you. It's so a tell wonderful. Valerie, we will. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. It really is. And Dennis has a new book coming out in April, I think it is, sometime in the spring. Okay, all right, all right. Are we about done? I don't yeah, know. how are we doing on time, Barbara? We're okay. Is there anything from YouTube or Facebook that we probably, it's hard to monitor them because they move so fast, you, you have trouble seeing them. There's a slight delay too. Um, well, I, you, you said you have 89 books in the series. Are there, they're all, they all have continuity between them, all the same characters or? Oh, oh no, they just, 89 different books. The FBI oh. series is 26 books. 26. And another okay. series that's 11 books. Some of them are single, most are trilogies or quartets. So they're all, it's all over the place. Okay. And um, is there anything that you enjoyed writing about this book in particular? Um, you know, any, were the characters in the story, did it come out like, uh, I don't know. Did you enjoy writing this book? compared to some of your other novels? I really, really enjoyed this book. And I had no idea what was going to happen when they got to the Greenbrier. That was all, it just happened. I had no idea what was going to happen. And it just, it just came. And so, yeah, that was tons of fun. Tons of fun. I love this book. It has some remarkable action scenes, a couple of which are really surprising. I really like the characters. I love the fact that it ends in a in a hopeful place, despite all the bad things that went on with it. <laughs> um, so you know that I mean, not every book does that. So I think well, all of mine do. I promise they all end. There's always justice. I'm never going to bum you out at the end after your commitment to getting there. You know, I'm going to have justice. Things will end well. Well, I think, you know, that's true with justice, but I don't know that in every book of anybody's that the characters also, you know, are in a, in a, in a, in a really good place in addition to the fact that justice has been achieved. But I thought, I you're, thought, you're right, you're right. I thought your characters were especially rewarded um, in this book, which is a lot of fun. Catherine's books really move very well. Um, they're fast potted, um, but they're not shallow. And I, I just love that. I thought this was a terrific book. So let me recommend it. We do have signed copies left. Um, and I want to thank Catherine for spending another hour with us. Are we ever going to get you to Scottsdale or are we just going to continue this whole commute thing? <gasps> we'll see. We'll see. Okay. I would no promises. Well, you know what? I'm going to be coming from, for a wedding in the middle of December to Tempe. Now that's right next door to you, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'll Wonderful. probably maybe, say maybe hi. We could just have a conversation in the store or something. That'd be that'd be fun. The one time I remember you being there, you were either at the Arizona Women's Board lunch or the Brandeis lunch. I think it was the Women's Board lunch, and I was unfortunately away, and so I didn't get to meet you. But my whole staff was so excited that you were there. Well, I thought it was a lot of gall on your part not to be there. I know, I know, you know, I should just be there like, yeah, 360 days a year. <laughs> it doesn't always well, work. Well, I, I will probably see you in mid-December then. You know, that would I be, will try. be wonderful. Do let me know and we'll figure out something. Anyway, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon and um, be well. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them. 
and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.